We're entering the second week of Ken Paxton's impeachment trial, the biggest political trial in this state in more than a century. In the first week, a witness explained why it was important that Paxton's mistress had landed a job. Because it answered the question, why is he engaging in all these activities? And, and it was like... Made on behalf of Mr. Paul. On behalf of Mr. Paul. And there was an accusation of a political overthrow at the attorney general's office. You were involved in staging a coup, weren't you? Plus, Ken Paxton skipped out on his own trial. We analyze all of that and much more on an extended roundtable. Also, Texans were once again asked to cut back on their electricity use as summer heat just keeps going strong. Now Congressman Greg Kassar is drafting legislation to help prevent future electricity blackouts. He joins us this morning. And a crucial ruling on Governor Abbott's buoy barrier in the middle of the Rio Grande. A lot to get to. Inside Texas Politics starts right now. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. A good Sunday morning to you, everybody. I'm Jason Wheeler in for Jason Whiteley this week. We are coming to you from Austin, right there, the Capitol behind me, where the impeachment trial of suspended Attorney General Ken Paxton has been underway. We are headed into week two of that trial. Uh, starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Now, Ken Paxton will not have to testify in his own defense. That ruling was made by the presiding officer, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Ken Paxton fundraised off of this trial last week, even though he wasn't present at the trial, except for several hours in the morning on day one. Now, this trial is expected to last for at least three weeks. We could see more than 100 witnesses called to the stand. So far in week one, we've only had a handful of witnesses testify. Now, a reminder, if you would like to watch this trial yourself, there are a couple of ways to do that. You can see it in person uh, by getting a free ticket where you're able to sit right up there in the Senate gallery and take it all in or you can do it right there from the comfort of your own home because we are live streaming the trial on our website. We've got a lot more to get to on the impeachment trial here in just a moment. First though, let's talk about something else that's been affecting all of us, electricity. Summer still very much holding on here in Texas right now. ERCOT, the state's electric grid operator, has put out uh, more urgent appeals to Texans in recent days to cut back on their electricity usage. Now, we've seen a number of those appeals, of course, since the near collapse of the electric grid in this state back in February of 2021. Now, though, Congressman Greg Kassar is introducing federal legislation that would require Texas to plug in to the federal electric grid. Kassar is a Democrat whose congressional district runs down I-35 from East Austin to Hayes County to the west side of San Antonio. Congressman Kassar, thanks uh, so much for being with us here. Um, you are joining us as we speak here in this interview in Austin. And so you, as well as all other Texans, have been under this latest conservation alert uh, from ERCOT, the state's electric grid operator. They've been blaming high temperatures and declining wind and solar generation. Some folks in renewables uh, take that very personally. They've been on social media saying it looks like a big power plant must have tripped offline as well. Uh, isn't this much bigger than the blame game as to what is responsible uh, and the political and economic battle between renewable and non-renewable? This is a much bigger issue uh, because Texas's grid is the only major grid in the country that is not interconnected with the national grids. And folks ask what that means. And essentially what it means is that when we're struggling and don't have enough power to meet demand, we're not able to pull in electricity from other states. So when we need help, we can't get help. And when other states need help, we can't sell them power. And that just doesn't make any sense. We are now drafting up a bill to finally require Texas to interconnect with the national grids. That way, when power demand is up because there's extreme heat or extreme cold and supply is down for whatever reason, that we're able to pull in supply from other states. It's just common sense. 
Okay, so over the years, Texas has been able to separate itself from the national grid, and it's been very proud of that because then it doesn't have to respond to federal regulations because this is a grid just in the state of Texas. Uh, so this is going to ruffle some feathers when you start talking about federal legislation. Can the feds do it? Have you already gamed this out? The feds absolutely have the authority to provide consumer protections, to ensure there's reliability across the grid, and to protect the lives of people in the United States. So the Congress has this authority. And I don't think anybody was proud when we had hundreds of people die in Winter Storm Uri and millions of people without power. And I think it's important to note that not all of Texas is disconnected from the national grids. In far west parts of Texas, in El Paso, they're interconnected with the western grid. In east Texas, in Jasper, they're connected with the national grid. And during that winter storm, Yuri, you didn't see mass blackouts in Jasper. You didn't have mass blackouts and power outages in El Paso because they were able to pull in power from their neighbors. This is the United States of America, and we need to support other states and have other states support us. While we're talking about the grip of these horrible summer temperatures that so many of us have been experiencing, and we're being asked to maybe bump that AC up a few degrees, you're one of the members on the House Oversight Committee who signed a letter uh, asking the chairman to uh, start a federal investigation looking into no AC in prisons across the country with a specific focus on Texas, uh, where we know that there have been uh, folks over the years, according to studies, uh, uh, as many as 13% of the deaths in Texas in the warmer months in the prisons are attributable to extreme heat days. Uh, and yet uh, it's estimated 70% of prisons in this state do not have air conditioning in, in most of the living areas. We know that the dollars are there to do the right thing and make sure that we have air conditioning in Texas prisons. Everybody, as we face this extreme heat, needs to be able to be safe and have air conditioning. Right now, for example, the Austin City Council is moving forward on rules to make sure that that's a requirement in everybody's residence. But think about it in a prison. Uh, you oftentimes are in a small cell, a concrete block that can get so hot you can't just walk outside. You can't quickly get in the sun. So people have been reportedly putting their bed sheets into the toilet to be able to wipe themselves off and cool off and survive. And that's just not right. People in prison are getting held accountable for what it is that they have done. But it is unconstitutional and un-American for us to engage in cruel and unusual punishment. And baking in the 110, 115 degree heat in a prison cell is that definition of cruel and unusual punishment. And we should point out that the guards who work in those prisons have to deal with those uh, conditions as well. Uh, Congressman right, Greg Kassar, that, uh, that is all the time we have uh, this morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come, a look at the Paxton impeachment proceedings. The prosecution and defense have presented opening statements, and we've heard from a handful of key witnesses. How have the two sides done so far? And how is Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick doing as presiding judge? That and much more in the roundtable next. Welcome back. In just a moment, we're going to have an extended version of our roundtable this week as we get a whole lot deeper into the impeachment trial of suspended Attorney General Ken Paxton. But believe it or not, there are some other political headlines to get to this week. Here are a few of those. Governor Abbott got a temporary victory. A federal appeals court halted another judge's order for Texas to remove its buoys in the middle of the Rio Grande, granting Texas request to leave the barrier in place pending further review. Governor Abbott had the controversial thousand foot long string of buoys installed two months ago, trying to prevent migrants from illegally crossing the border through the river near Eagle Pass. Another Democrat has joined the increasingly crowded Democratic primary to challenge U.S. Senator Ted Cruz next year. Mark Gonzalez, the district attorney for Nueces County, announced on Tuesday he would be entering the race. In kicking off his campaign, Gonzalez resigned from his current DA position. A Texas state senator and U.S. congressman are already running to take on Cruz next year. And the Texas Department of Criminal Justice has issued a statewide lockdown of all its prison facilities because of an increase of illegal drugs in prisons and inmate violence, including homicides. This action now limits the movements of 129,000 inmates and all visits to inmates are canceled. 
The lockdown will continue until all 100 prisons have been searched for contraband. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. All right, time now for our reporters roundtable. And this week it is all about the Paxton impeachment trial. What else? Uh, there is a lot to get to there, so let's do it. Uh, we have our guests joining us today, Ian Mitra, the senior managing editor of the Texas Tribune, as well as uh, Bug Kennedy, as usual, from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. Uh, thanks to you all for uh, being with us here again this week. A lot to talk about. I want to start off with the prosecution, because because that's how this trial began. Uh, how did the prosecutors do in your estimation? And uh, you know, feel free to talk about anything from opening statements all, through, all the way through their questioning so far. Uh, Bud, let's start with you. Well, I think the key was Andrew Murr when he set it up. You know, he, a lot of the rest of this trial has been played to the television audience, but Andrew Murr talked directly to the senators, his fellow lawmakers, in a very calm way. He laid out the details, and he said right up front, we heard echoes of this later in the week, he said, these don't have to be crimes. We're not trying to prove crimes. We're here to protect the people of Texas. That would come back into thoughts later in the week. He also said something that was very important to the senators. He said that they should resist manipulation from outside forces, and that's certainly going on. Ian, what was your thought uh, about the prosecution in the early going here? Well, looking at the uh, the prosecution, particularly uh, like when they're bringing witness up, you know, what stu stood out to me was credentials and concerns. I mean, they really brought out witnesses who had strong conservative credentials, who, you know, are very respected among, you know, the Republican Party. And, you know, also like really taking you through the concerns that they raised over periods of time about Ken Paxton, his relationship with with Nate Paul. And so they were very methodical in kind of how they laid this out. That That really stood out. Uh, Bernadine, let's uh, dig down into that a little bit. Uh, each witness that the uh, prosecution put on, uh, these witnesses who used to work in the Office of Attorney General under Ken Paxton, these were his hand-picked employees. They had worked with him for a long time. Many of them say that they looked up to him, they admired him. Uh, the prosecution has gone to great lengths to prove that these were not liberals or deep state actors. Uh, these were rock-ribbed Republicans. Uh, and uh, why are they doing that, and has that been effective? as far as you have seen? I think that it has been very effective because what the prosecutors have done, they have shown that the reason we are here today is because of the actions of Paxton, pa Paxton that these particular people saw, and it alarmed them. And, and I think that they did an excellent job. The witnesses were good, and they, they, it appeared as if the reason that they took this to the FBI, that they took the actions to the FBI were warranted if you listen to what these witnesses are saying. And I think that it was imperative that we hear from the beginning why we are here today. And I think they did an excellent job doing it. Bud, uh, we have been listening to the prosecution. Uh, you know, both sides here, of course, are under really strict time limits uh, for presenting their case. The prosecution this week said, uh, Judge, we may need some more of the time to be given back to us because we've had so many objections coming from the defense. Uh, the defense has been very aggressive uh, about that. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who is the presiding officer here, the judge in this case, has had to handle all those objections as well as uh, issues related to hearsay and attorney client privilege. Some legal experts have said that he's kind of bobbled it. He's very new to judgeship, though. Yeah, they're just trying to throw barricades in front of this trial and in front of the prosecution. They're trying to throw up everything they can and befuddle Dan Patrick. He really got in there the first day. He didn't understand exactly what the, the difference was uh, you know, between the, 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 the staff employees or whether they worked for the state or work for Paxton. They work for the people of Texas. Uh, you know the, the attorney-client relationship, yeah, and then, and then the second day that he had to be taught about hearsay. They've just uh, they've uh, they've objected over and over, and, and a better judge, an experienced judge, would have shut that down. Sorry about that, Bud. Just like the attorneys in this case, I spoke over you there for uh, just a second. Um, I, I want to finish with this, Ian. Uh, we've only heard from a handful of witnesses so far of what could be a hundred or more witnesses here. Hard to believe they're going to be able to fit all of that in. 
As we go into another week here, uh, a former Republican legislator told me he would advise the prosecution to kind of speed it up, be a little bit more succinct because he's worried about these senators who've been taking notes and seem very attentive. He's worried about their attention starting to drift. Uh, what are your thoughts about what the prosecution has been doing as far as it's been laying the case out uh, very meticulously so far this week? Yeah, I mean, they needed to go out to that very meticulous start. And, you know, after a couple of weeks of this, there is definitely going to be some, you know, some attention lost as, you know, there's just, a, you know, just too much information to, to, to consume. So there is something to that. But I think the, you know, the prosecution still has a case to lay out to also like, you know, they have very clear sets of witnesses. I wish we we had a little bit more insight with, you know, the witness list is, you know, is being kept close to the vest. But, uh, you know, with 24 hours given to each side for basically testimony, they, they will have to kind of speed things up because uh, there's a lot to get through. Bernadine, real quickly here, do you think they need to step on the gas a little bit? It does seem like uh, Patrick, I mean, he has the ability to extend their time, so they may not be in too much of a rush. Well, and then they understand their case. They understand what they're trying to present to the senators. So I would, I'm patient that they know what they're doing, but I'd like to get back to Patrick quickly because Patrick made it very clear at the beginning, I am neither a judge nor a, an attorney. So what I'm doing, I'm doing my best. I am learning as I go, and I think he's done a good job not knowing what he's doing going in, and he does have help. But I think that the prosecutors, they understand their job. They understand what they're doing, and they're doing a good job to me. Patrick has seemed to get uh, more comfortable as the days have gone. Uh, all right, Bernadine, Bud, and Ian, please stay put because we got to get to the defense. But first, let's fit in a quick break here. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. We are extending our roundtable this week here on Inside Texas Politics, of course, to uh, fully cover the Paxton impeachment trial that's going on in the Senate chambers. Let's bring back in our panel here. Bernadine Steptoe from WFAA, Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and Ian Mitra from the Texas Tribune. Thanks to you all for staying uh, involved with this here. Let's talk about the defense this time around, and I'll throw out the same question to a different person this time. Ian, uh, how did the defense do in week one as we get ready now for week two? Yeah, well, you can see it was a totally different approach from the defense as the first witnesses uh, came up uh, this first week. I mean, they were really looking to kind of uh, create a narrative of, of these uh, uh, deputy uh, assistant ge attorney generals of being rogue and, you know, even using words as like attempted coup and really kind of focus on this kind of uh, idea that all of these folks were basically trying to undermine Paxton and uh, you know, that's that was kind of the argument they made that they really wanted to kind of hammer home. And you can see them just doing that with each witness. Yeah, but uh, some people were commenting, wondering how long it would take Dan Patrick, who's presiding over all of this, to rein in Tony Busby. But uh, this is what a defense attorney does. And, and Busby did come out swinging and kept swinging. Well, of course, in his opening statement, you know, Busby brought all the color and pageantry that you get from a Houston trial lawyer. He, 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 came out with all, you know, just, and at it, it, the beginning it seemed like he was just trying to throw everything at the wall to see if it would stick. Uh, he questioned whether Paxton could get a fair trial. Uh, he, he started raising questions about Dade Phelan. You know, he, he just brought in like a, you know, every peripheral issue he could. Uh, and it, it, there was some question of whether that Paxton could really put on a credible defense. But then they got these witnesses on the stand. Yeah. They started drilling down on them, trying to make them all look like sniveling bureaucrats. Yeah, Bernadine, uh, a lot has been made of the fact that the suspended attorney general, Ken Paxton, was present on day one, uh, for the morning anyway, then they broke for lunch and he did not return. They questioned the rules on that and it turns out that the rules said he had to be there at 9 a.m. He checked that box. The rules didn't say he had to stay there after that. And so we didn't really see him again uh, through the week uh, for the most part there. Uh, how does that sit with, with senators? You do have to wonder, they're the jury here. They're having to be there. They've been through multiple multiple special sessions. A lot of them have been itching to go home. They're having to sit and listen to this testimony, but the man who this impeachment trial is centered around is not there. How do you think that's going over? You know what? The optic does not look well for him. And you must wonder how these senators do feel because they are forced by, by their duty to be there. And then, they're, and then the defendant doesn't show up. You have, I don't think that it looks very, it doesn't look good, obviously. But you have a defense who are, who are, who are adamantly 
and, and effectively trying to represent a client who doesn't even show up. And it just shows you that's one of the reasons he's been impeached, because he disrespected, uh, allegedly disrespected the House. So uh, I'd like to see how it plays out and if he shows back up in week two, because there has been a lot of talk about his absence. Of course, Bud, uh, some uh, observers have said, well, it makes sense that he wouldn't be there. He doesn't want, you know, photographs and video of him sitting as a defendant in a case uh, that's, you know, turned into political ads and so forth. So they say just for some political expediency there, he's, you know, maybe made the decision that that's not the best look for him. Well, you know, there's a couple of things going on there. I mean, he, you know, first of all, it, it doesn't help him to be there and have attention focused on him. You know, second of all, you know, there'd probably be some photos of him exchanging glances with the Senator Paxton, who's sitting in the in the audience at the chamber, although she's not uh, a member of the jury. Uh, he doesn't want that. He doesn't want to expose her to any more attention than needed. And plus, he can be out making calls and raising money. We saw that he sent out all these wild fundraising appeals this week, claiming that there was this you know, vast deep state conspiracy to throw him out of office. So he can be out making calls, raise more money to pay these lawyers. But you know what? You have to discipline your client. And everything that Bud said, yes, it works for Ken Paxton, but does it work for the senator? Well, the senators are going to be. We shall see. Uh, the as the we senators head. are running out of steam, I think. But go ahead, Jason. No, I'm sorry about that. Sorry to walk on you again there, but we've got that satellite delay thing going on, I think, here. Uh, but uh, we shall see how this goes in week two. Uh, this is a good wrap up, though, of what happened in week one. Thanks to all of you for uh, weighing in on that. And thank you at home uh, for watching. We will do it all again next Sunday.